Okay, so uh, in this talk, I would be talking about efficient discrete fair division. So uh, this was joint work with Kavita, Kurt, and Alkmini, and this was done when all of us were at Max Planck for informatics in Zabrucken this summer. And uh, yeah, so I would get right into what is the setup. So at the so ju just something I would like to mention right at the beginning is that. The first few slides would be around the setup and kind of the definitions of what is meant by efficient, what is meant by uh, NV free allocations, what is meant by fairness. If there are any sort of questions, I mean, if any definition is unclear or if, if you feel like, yeah, this is not a good definition, maybe I, want, I, I expected something more, <laughs> then please feel free to stop me. And it is important that you stop me because for you to, I mean, be with me till the end of the talk. Okay, so let's just get started. So. In a discrete fair division, we typically, I mean, have three, I mean, three components. Like you have a set of n agents, you have a set of indivisible goods here. I mean, that's why I, I talk about discrete fair division. I mean, uh, cake cutting. I mean, the case of divisible goods has a very rich literature in itself, and I won't be covering any of those here. And we assume that every agent has a valuation function, which kind of captures. I mean, which is defined on every all the subsets of goods. So this kind of captures how much this agent, I mean, how much utility this agent derives from any subset of these goods. And the important part of this talk is that I'm gonna make the assumption of general valuation. So by general valuations, I mean that valuations which are just monotonic and normalized. So by monotonic, I mean that if I give an agent an extra good, then he will not be worse off. His valuation would be at the same point as he was before, at least at the same point as he was before, and by normalization, I mean that if I give an agent nothing, he has zero units of utility. So these are reasonable assumptions, usually. And uh, unless specified otherwise, we are always dealing with general valuations. Okay, so these are the, th uh, th these are the components, usually, you have in a fair division instance. And typically, what we want is we want to find a partition of the good set into n disjoint subsets. So think of each xi, I mean each bundle xi being allocated to agent i. And we want to be fair, whatever that means. So I would get to there in a minute. And uh, so before I get into what is fair and all, I would just like to say that uh, if you like to know more, there is this website, Split It, I mean courtesy of Nisarik and others. It's a wonderful website dedicated to theory and practice of fair division. Uh, so you can find a lot of applications and you can also find the algorithms underlying. So they use different fairness, I mean they use different algorithms depending on your tasks. So for instance, you could use this for dividing indivisible goods, something like jewelry, something like inheritance property. If you want to assign rooms and split the rent among people, if you want, if, if there are multiple people taking cabs and you want to split the taxi fare fairly depending on their sources and their destination. If you want to move away from the set of goods and if you want to move to the setting of tasks, like you want to split tasks such that you don't overload any particular agent, you want to be, you want to fairly divide chores, this is also an application. And quite recently you would uh, find that the, 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 there, are, there are also applications on say assigning courses to students. And this actually has been implemented by Buddhist and others, mostly it's the Wharton School in UPenn. So, I mean, if I want to do justice to applications, I guess this talk won't be enough, but I just want to tell you that, I mean, it is very well motivated, and for more things, you can actually look this website up. Good, so let's come to the notions of fairness. So when we talk about being fair, the first thing that at least, uh, that may come to our mind is that of envy freeness. So I say that, well, I mean, a, a, a partition of the goods is fair. If you take any pair of agents, and the agent says that I don't envy the other agent. So by this, what I mean that I'm actually happy with my bundle. So my bundle is at least worth any other bundle. That, I mean, this is, this is the notion of envy freeness. And it's important to note that on the left and the right hand side, you have the same valuation function, vi. So it, the envy actually doesn't depend on, I mean, the envy for agent i, it actually doesn't depend on how happy j is. It actually is only a function of the bundle that J has. So I believe that had I had J's bundle, then I might have been better off. Only in that case, I would have an envy. It's not a function of how happy J is. Okay. That being said, 
throughout the talk, whenever I would define a notion of fairness, the two questions that are of interest would be, the first question is, is it always possible to be fair? So no matter how many agents we have, no matter how many goods we have, no matter how bad the valuation functions may look like, can we be fair? Can we, can we always find an allocation that satisfies our fairness criterion? So this is the first question. Depending on the answer to this question, I would ask about how efficiently can we determine this fair allocation. So let's, let's, let's do it here. So let's say the notion is envy freeness. I ask this question that is it possible to be fair? And I think it's pretty clear that no, this is too much to ask for. I mean, consider a very simple instance where you have say two agents and one indivisible good, which is valuable to both the agents. Any kind of allocation would allocate this good to one of the agents and then you would, have, you would be having an NB. So this is actually too much to ask for. So henceforth people thought about relaxations of NB freeness. So again, now I would be coming into more specific definitions. If you have questions, then please feel free to stop me. So the first relaxation that is called NV freeness up to one good. So here we say that NV freeness is too much to ask for. So instead we ask the following, that consider any pair of agents, I and J, and now it's okay if agent I envies agent J. But now I, I say that, okay, if J did not have a particular good, and if I remove this good from J's bundle, then I would not be worse off. Note that I'm not removing any goods. So this is just a, uh, this is just a way in which agent I is convincing itself that the allocation has been fair to him. So once you fix an allocation, agent I looks at his own bundle, he looks at J's bundle, and he said, okay, I may envy J, but had J not had this particular good, and since this quantifier is sum, it's an existential quantifier, this sum good is usually the most valuable good in, the, in XJ according to I. So agent I would say that had, XJ did, uh, had J not had its most valuable good according to me, then, well, I would be not worse off, or I might even be better off. So this is the notion of envy freeness up to one good. It was actually talked about by Bodish. I see it was introduced by Bodish. And now I ask the same set of questions again. Oh, sorry. So before I ask, I guess I would just give you an example. So consider this, this, this simple say, setting where you have, say, two agents and three goods. And let's assume additive valuations for now. So where, I mean, valuation on a particular set is the sum of the valuation on individual goods of that set. So consider an allocation which is the following, where I give good one and good three to agent one, and I give good two to agent two. So agent one has a utility of 16, while agent two has a utility of nine. Agent one is more than happy, but according to agent two, agent one has a utility of 13, which is more than what he has. But now he says that, well, if agent one did not have his most valuable good, which is G1, then agent one is just left with a good G3, and then I'm actually better off. I have a utility of nine, while he would just be having a utility of three. So this is a feasible EF1 allocation. An alternate EF1 allocation would be something like this, where say you give agent one G1 and you give agent two G2 and G3. This is kind of more satisfying because um, if you look at here, then no matter which good you remove from, so clearly agent two is very much content. Now agent one would envy agent two, but no matter which good you remove from here, I mean, agent one would be better off. So this is also another feasible EF1 allocation. Okay, so any questions regarding the definition of EF1? Yes. Exactly. That, that, that's, the, that's the question where we are getting at. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so given this notion of fairness, we ask the same set of questions, that is it always possible to be fair? The notion being EF1, the answer is yes. Uh, it's a result by Lipton. It's very, uh, I mean, it's, 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 a pretty, it's a pretty neat algorithm. And it uh, in fact tells us that uh, no matter what the valuation functions look like, in strongly polynomially many value queries, so by value query I mean that, so in these kinds of instances it doesn't make quite sense to talk about P and NP because the valuation function itself can be very hard to represent. So we kind of talk about the complexity in terms of the number of queries. So uh, yeah, so here he says that no matter how, I mean, no matter what the valuation functions may look like, if I ask strongly polynomial many value queries, where a value query is you give an agent and I give him a set and I ask this agent, what is the valuation on this set? 
By strongly polynomially many queries of this kind, I can always find an allocation which is EF1, no matter what the valuations may look like. Okay, so let's look at one of some drawbacks of EF1 allocations. So consider this simple example where you have, say, two agents, say, the goods you have to distribute is two pizzas and a house. And consider this, an, this allocation, where I give agent one a house and a pizza, and I give only a pizza to agent two. Okay? So this is EF1, right? Because agent one is very well off. Now agent two is actually going to envy agent one because, uh, I mean, well, there's a, the valuations are highly skewed. However, he, agent two says, well, if he didn't have the most valuable good, which is the house, then we are kind of the same. So I will not, I mean, envy him anymore. So this is actually an EF1, but this kind of doesn't look fair. So, I mean, unless there are people who say that a pizza is more valuable than a house. So, okay, so this kind of doesn't look fair, but it's important why it doesn't look fair. So had I only had one house and two agents, even then the valuations would be skewed, right? There is no way in which, I mean, I can avoid this huge skew in the valuations then what is actually being unfair? So the concern is who gets the house should not get anything more. So if you have kind of like many agents, and uh, if you have something like this, which is a super expensive thing, then the agents can kind of console themselves that, well, it's like a lottery, and it quite makes sense that I may not get this house. It's highly unlikely that I may get this house. But the person who already gets this should not get something else. I mean, it's, 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 this is kind of, I mean, one of the few drawbacks and we would like to overcome this drawback. So as Jakob pointed out, we would now look at a weaker relaxation, something which is closer to envy freeness. Rather, this is called, I mean, probably the strongest notion of envy, I mean, strong, the closest notion to envy freeness in case of uh, indivisible goods. So here, I just flip the quantifier. So I say that, well, it's okay for agent I to envy agent J, but no matter which good I remove, I should actually be, I mean, better off or not worse off. So intuitively, this means that even if I remove the least valuable good in J's bundle, according to me, even then I should actually be better off. So in this allocation, as you can see, this is clearly not EFX because the least valuable good in this bundle is the pizza and then he's left with the house and there's a huge envy there. Uh, this, I mean, this is not just the only motivation for EFX. I can actually see a lot of things. Because this, this barrier can be overcome with some other notions of fairness. I mean, many of you might be even be aware with something called max min share. So that can also overcome this kind of a barrier in this two agent setting. Anyways, coming back to EFX, let's repeat our two questions. Like, is it always possible to be fair? Now this notion being EFX. And the answer is not known yet. So let me tell you the state of the art for now. This is a paper by Tim and Benjamin. Yeah. No, you have, you give a house to one of the agents and two pizzas to the other. So then the guy only has a house. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but like I said, I mean, if you just have a house, then also the same situation comes. Okay. Going back, so uh, this current state of the art, I mean, it is like it's a paper by Tim and uh, Benjamin. So where they show that it exists in some particular settings. In particular, if you have just two agents and with general valuations, then EFX allocations exist. If you have more than two agents, but all of them have identical valuations, which on the first glance may look like the hard case, because identical valuations means that the agents are actually fighting for the goods and there it might be actually harder to be fair. But e even in this case, um, yeah, I mean, EFX allocations exist. But the moment you go from, I mean, the moment you go to the case of three agents and above, even for the simplest class of valuations, namely the additive valuations, I mean, we do not know anything. So, I mean, so clear, even for general, we do not know. So what I mean is that for a very simple class of valuations, for n equals to three agents, we don't have a proof that EFX exists. For n equals to 3 and above, for um, arbitrary valuations, we cannot disprove that EFX doesn't exist. E EFX exists, sorry. Okay, so in that spirit, I would like to tell you the main result of this paper, where we attempt to 
settle this question, we get to some, I mean, we make some progress, and I would like to actually highlight on that. So we say that, well, given this instance, instead of give, partitioning it into n bundles, I would partition it into n plus 1 bundles now. The first n bundles are allocated to the agents. And there I can guarantee the EFX property. So I'm actually keeping some set of goods unallocated. But whatever I allocate, I'm guaranteeing EFX. But this statement as in, as in itself is meaningless because I could very well throw the whole set of goods into the pool of unallocated goods, give everyone nothing, and that is trivially NV free. So it is NV free up to any good as well. So I need to give you some bound on the goods that are unallocated, either in terms of do I throw valuable goods into the pool or how many goods I throw into the pool, some sort of bounce. So we kind of give both. So first thing is that, well, no agent will envy the pool. So every agent is actually more content with his bundle than with the bundle that is not allocated or we, we call it in our paper like a bundle that has been donated to charity or something like that. So no agent actually envies the pool, so which says that you do not have a lot of very valuable items in the pool according to any agent. Second thing, less than n goods go to the pool. So where n is the number of agents, which is significantly less than the number of, uh, and the number of goods. So in particular, if you look at the three agent case, I say that, well, for general valuations, if I can take two goods, I mean, if I can keep two not so very valuable goods unallocated, then I can always guarantee EFX. It's like a corollary of the main result. For the rest, for the majority of the rest of the talk, I would actually prove this main result and then some more consequences of it. Uh, any questions up to now? Okay. So to this end, I introduce a very standard tool that is used, um, which is the notion of NV graph. So if you give me an allocation, so if I fix, an, fix a partition, I mean x, x1 up to xn, then I construct this graph where the vertices correspond to the agents, and there is an NV edge from an agent to uh, one agent to the other if, I mean, the agent envies the other agent. So for instance, if you look at, I mean, here I have seven agents and the allocations are X1 up to X7. And so we have vertices corresponding to these agents and depending on the bundles and depending on the NV, we have the NV edges. So as simple as it is, I mean, it's just an, it's just an NV graph. And now the first observation that you can make about the NV graph is that it is acyclic. I mean, you can assume it's not acyclic, but you can assume without loss of generality that it is acyclic. The reason being that, well, if you have a cycle, for instance, here, between agent 3, 4, 5, 5, and 6, then I can exchange the bundles along the cycle, and everyone would actually be better off. So let's look at it. So I, let's say I do this exchange. So these NV edges along the cycle would disappear. Now let's argue about the edges that are incoming to the cycle and the edges that are outgoing from the cycle. For the edges that are outgoing from the cycle, let's look at this edge from A A6 to A7. This may or may not be there. This edge from A6 to A7 may or may not be there. Why? Because agent 6 has got better off. So this won't introduce new NV edges, but existing NV edges may disappear. And what about the edges incoming? So as I said right at the, right at the beginning, that it's important. So if an agent envies another agent, it's, not, it's because of the bundle that the agent has. So here, for instance, if you see the bundles remain intact, I've just changed the ownership. So the arrows that were there, so the, so the incoming arrows kind of rearrange topologically. So here there was an arrow from A2 to A6 because A agent 6 had the bundle X6. Now the bundle X6 is right now with A4, so this edge reorients from A2 to A4. There was an edge from A2 to A3, now X3 is with agent 5, so this edge reorients. Importantly, we do not introduce any more new NV edges, and the NV edges along the cycle, they disappear. So the edge count decreases. You can keep doing this until you can make it acyclic. In particular, you don't change the allocation. You, the partition remains the same. You just change the ownership. So it's, you can call it somehow like a permutation of the, I mean, the first partition. So from the, for the rest of the talk, whenever I would be talking about an NV graph, I will always talk about an acyclic NV graph. So now is uh, a simple tool, but this would be very crucial in proving the main result, is the notion of what I call the most envious agent. So here, I want to quantify the amount of envy any agent has for any set. 
So consider this example where you have an agent and a set S. So the agent currently has the bundle XI and he clearly envies the set S, right? Because, um, yeah, I mean, it is more expensive. And these, and these are the goods kind of stacked one on top of each other. I mean, sorted according to the valuation the agent has for the goods. So agent I clearly envies agent S. Now, if I want to quantify the amount of envy here, the envy from agent I to agent S, the immediate approach would be to just look at the difference in valuations. That kind of quantifies how much envy you have. But given that the underlying notion of fairness is that of envy freeness up to any good, where you talk about envy freeness after removal of goods, the, the correct, no, I mean, the more natural notion of quantifying the envy is looking at the smallest subset of S that agent I still envies. So for instance, here S has five goods. And five goods he definitely envies, but just these two goods are enough for him to actually envy the set. So, so ZI is the smallest subset of S that agent I still envies. And the smaller the size of this set is, I say larger the envy for the agent for this particular set. And we would see why it is crucial just in the next slide. So this is kind of what we quantify, the amount of envy agent I has for the set S, the size of the smallest subset that he still envies. So let's look at an example. So, what, so naturally the most envious agents would be the agents with the smallest value of this kappas. So let's look at this example. So you have the set S, now you have three agents. And for agent one, if you just have two, two goods from S, it's sufficient for him to envy. For agent two, you need to have three. And for agent three, you need to have four. So clearly, by our definition of the most envious agent, the most envious agent is agent one. Now, why is such a definition important? The important thing is, well, this bundle that you have of compre yes. Is the valuation function additive for each No, it's not additive. I mean, in this example, it might look additive, but the definition is, is not additive. You just look at the smallest subset of S that is still more valuable to the agent than Xi. So the picture, I mean, just to make it easier, I mean, I, I made it additive. There's a question, how do you find that subset? Yeah, I mean, that's an algorithmic question. We'll come to that later. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's where it gets hard. <laughs> exactly. So, um, okay. So why is, this, why is this set interesting? So well, first of all, this set is more valuable to this agent than X1. And more importantly, no other agent envies this set up to any good, right? Because for any subset of S, for 2 to NV, it has to have size at least 3. For any subset of S, for 3 to NV, it has to have size at least 4. There might be ties, because there might be other agents who might also have, I mean, the size of ZI to be 2, but there won't be NV following the removal of a good. So nobody would envy this set up to any good. So this is why this set is interesting. Because first of all, it is more valuable to the agent than its current allocation, and everybody's fine with it, kind of. Like nobody would, I mean, oppose if I say give this set to this agent. Okay, so these are the two simple tools that I wanted to introduce. The NV graph and the notion of the most envious agent. And surprisingly enough, this is sufficient to get our results. So this is kind of formalizing what I just now said. So given a partition, take any subset, identify the most envious agent, then I claim that none of the other agent strongly envies this subset. I mean, nobody envies this up to any good. All right. Now, the algorithm is very simple. So always I maintain a partial allocation and a pool of unallocated goods. And the invariant being that the partial allocation is EFX. And as long as some preconditions are satisfied, which I would be mentioning in a minute, I keep applying three simple update rules. And I would argue that I'm making some kind of progress. And these update rules will not be applicable anymore when their preconditions are not satisfied. And then you would see that we would arrive at our, the three conditions of our theorem. So at the beginning, for instance, we start with a trivial partial EFX allocation where we throw everything into the pool and every agent has a null set. So this is trivially EFX. Now, as long as one of these update rules are applicable, I would apply them. I would update my partial allocation and my pool and I would just keep going. So let's get into these rules. So the first update rule is applicable whenever you have an agent who envies the pool. So let's see. So consider that this is your NV graph. So as I said, I would assume that it is acyclic. 
So you have two sources, A1 and A8, and now there are three agents, namely A3, A4, and A11, who actually envies the pool. In that case, I identify the most envious agent, that is, in this case, let's assume that it is agent 3, and I kind of swap the bundles at the beginning, so I give agent 3 the pool, and I throw whatever he had back into the pool. So now as you see that these red edges directed to the pool would be directed towards this agent. I mean, there might be red, I mean, yeah. And now what I say is like, okay, but since he's the most envious agent, I don't need to give him the whole pool. I just need to give him the smallest subset that is still valuable to him. And then these blue edges would disappear by our previous observation. I mean, they may, they may be there, they may not be there. I mean, they may be there if, if you have multiple most envious agents. And as you can see, so you might say that, well, now you have more agents envying the pool, I, but I actually don't care. Because if you look at the valuation vector, I mean, if you look at the valuations of the agents, the valuations of the agents, the other agents remain the same, and the valuation of this agent improves. So there is some sort of a progress. If you look at the valuation vector, it's improving on the Pareto front. And if I just keep applying this update rule, so I'm not even discussing the other two update rules, if I just apply this update rule, until it's no longer applicable, I already have the first two conditions of my theorem. That I have a partial allocation which is EFX, and nobody envies the pool. So the rest of the update rules would be to kind of reduce the size of the pool. Any questions up to now? So you want the pool to contain only less than N? Yeah, so the rest okay, of the... One, one less is enough. Mm -hmm. like you start with all, what is N? And it's the number of agents, so, no, so that is just significantly less. So if you have three agents, yeah, and yeah. good. Any, yes. What is, the, like, what is the equation for wanting the pool to have few items, even though? Like, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you you mean that it suffices to stop here? No, no, I'm just asking. I mean, in the sense that okay, I think I, I felt that it was more important that no agent sort of envies the pool because you don't want to just put everything. In. Exactly. So, I mean, since the question is envy freeness following the removal of a good, I mean, like, since we, since we, I mean, it's interesting to know on what large subset of the good set we can guarantee any effects. It's like you have just removed at most one item from every Yeah, something like that. So, I mean, every, yeah, every, so since, yeah, every agent, I mean, if, I mean, I'm just taking one more item away from them. So, every agent is kind of giving one item, which is not, super, super valuable to him or her. Okay, so um, now the two update rules, U2 and U3 would be dedicated to reducing the size of the pool. So U2 is applicable, it's the simplest of the update rules. It's applicable whenever you can pick a good from the pool, allocate it to some agent, and the others are fine. I mean, there is no, I mean, there is no NV, strong NVH, that means NVH up to any good produced. So for instance, if I take a good from the pool, and I allocate it to the agent one, and if it may produce blue edges, but I'm fine as long as it doesn't produce red edges, I'll continue. And what is the progress we are making here? Well, the pool size is reducing. If you assume non-zero marginals, then we can also argue that we make progress on the Pareto front of the valuation vector. Well, let's not assume that, but at least we know that the pool size is reducing with every application of this rule. So we cannot have more than m consecutive applications of this update rule. So where m is the number of um, goods in the pool. Okay, so the next rule is the most complicated rule, and this is applicable whenever the first rule, I mean, the, the rule that I just showed you right now is no longer applicable. That means if you take any good from the pool, allocate it to any agent, there would be red edges produced. So U2 is no longer applicable, and the size of the pool is larger than or equal to N. So as long as you have sufficiently large items in the pool, I can still make progress. So how does this go? So let's, let me give you a warm up. So let's start with a simple case where the NV graph has just a single source. Okay, so I take a good from the pool, I give it to the source, I know there would be red edges, people will not be, be okay with it. So there is agent five, seven, and six, so five, six, seven, that actually envies this new bundle. Well, I identify the most envious agent. The good thing here is I kind of have a cycle, so maybe I can try, yeah. Yeah, I think I should have mentioned that. Very good point. So blue edge, so envy edge. So, so for instance, from one to two, you have a, so before I put this good, from one to two, you had a blue edge. So it says that 
according to one, x2 is more valuable than x1. But if I remove any good from x2, then this blue edge will disappear. But the red edge is, it, there is NV, but even if I remove any good, the red edge will, there would be still an edge. It may still be red, but, or it will be blue. But there will still be an edge. So that is strong NV, which is what we are trying to prevent. Any good, any good. So that's, that's the important. So throughout we are talking about you remove any good, I mean, these blue edges would disappear. Okay, so coming back, so we identify the most envious agent. We have a cycle. We can try something similar. So let's exchange things along a cycle. So, well, then this conflicted bundle, I mean, the bundle for which people are fighting now goes to the most envious agent, a agent seven, and the red edges are kind of redirected. And the agents along the cycle, they kind of improve in their valuation. But now we do the same trick. Well, because the conflicted bundle is with the agent who envies it the most. So then just give him what suffices and throw the rest of the things back into the pool. So then the red edges would immediately disappear. And all the agents along the cycle have strictly improved in their valuation. So the new allocation is EFX and the valuation vector actually improves on the Pareto front. So what was crucial here? The crucial thing is that we, we should get the most, I mean, I mean, if there is a bundle which is a conflicted bundle, we should be able to get it to the most envious agent without decreasing the valuation of anybody else. If this conflicted bundle is the pool, it is very easy to do because I can just exchange. If, it, if the envy graph has just one source, even then I can get this mo conflicted bundle to the most envious agent and still do my tricks. When is this not possible? When your envy graph has multiple sources, and the most envious agent could not, I mean, maybe in, in another sub, I mean, may not be reachable from your source. So let's look at that example. So when you have multiple sources, now when I put a good on S1, then well, then you could have a most envious agent somewhere else, which is not reachable from S1, and I cannot apply this trick anymore. But then I have the guarantee that our pool has sufficiently large goods. And no matter which good I choose, there would, be a most en I mean, there would be a most envious agent because U2 is not applicable. So I take another good, I put it on the next source, I mean the source of the most envious agent. Then I get another most envious agent who may still be, I mean, not in the connected, I mean, may not be reachable from any of these. But as long as I have more goods than number of sources, I can keep doing this until I get a cycle. And once I get a cycle, I can do the same trick. I can get the conflicted bundles to their most envious agents without decreasing the valuation vector. And now I just give them the bare minimum that suffices and throw the rest back into the pool. You have a question? So this doesn't reduce the size of the right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. So I mean, so the for the previous rule was that you can have at most m consecutive applications. So if you look at m plus 1 applications of any update rules, then I can say that the valuation vector improves. Because at most m of them could be an application where the valuation vector will not improve. And even when you apply that rule, the valuation vector does not decrease. I mean, an agent may not strictly improve, but nobody decreases. So if you look at a, a chunks of m plus 1, then, it, then we make improvements. Okay, so yeah, the new allocation is EFX, the valuation vector improves. So now we stop when none of our update rules are applicable. And in that case, we have a partial allocation, which is EFX. Nobody envies the pool. The size of the pool is small. I mean, less than N goods go to charity. So this is the statement. I mean, this is what I promised you at the beginning. The important thing is this holds for general valuation functions. And uh, an alternative statement could be, so here's a mistake, this should be a capital S, sorry. So uh, if you have one agent who is beyond envy, I mean like if you have one agent who is perfectly fine no matter what you give him, and now no matter what the valuation functions of the other agents may look like, you can always guarantee EFX because, well, run this algorithm on the rest, remaining n minus one agents and whatever goes to, I mean whatever remains unallocated, you can allocate it to this agent. Okay, so from here on, I would look at a very special case, which are additive valuations, where the valuation on any particular bundle is the sum of the valuation. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, 
the running time is pseudo polynomial because we are arguing in terms of improvement of the evaluation vector, but still, if you're looking at approximate envy, like one plus epsilon EFX, where I only shift bundles if there's a one plus epsilon improvement, then it would give a FP TUS immediately. Assuming you can find the most envious, which is one Right, 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 right. So that, that this, the, yes, yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, so this, this holds not for general valuations, but for gross substitute valuations, you can find the most envious agents with polynomially many value, value queries. So up to gross substitute, you can get an FP TAS or a pseudo polynomial time algorithm. But, yeah. Beyond that, it would be. Beyond that, it's, I mean, I don't know about this property, but so for instance, in Tim's paper, there's a result that if you have just two agents with submodular valuation functions, and even there to find an EFX allocation, you need exponentially many value queries. So I mean, you give, um, so I mean, so we are doing it for a gross substitute, but with charity, we are trying to get as close as we can. Okay, so any more questions? Yeah, one so this is really not very common. But if you looked at the substitute <coughs> which are actually allocated to those agents, can you say something about that substitute? Uh, on the contrary, it's inefficient. This is not Pareto optimal. I mean, even if you look at the subset, I can prove that it is not Pareto optimal. So always it will be non-Pareto optimal. When you say always, you mean from your algorithm? Yeah, I mean, no matter. I mean, if, if, if our algorithm is fail, if there is some goods that are still unallocated, and our, I mean, because some preconditions of the update rules are failing, that's why we cannot allocate them. In that case, whatever you have allocated, I can prove that it is not Pareto optimal. There is an allocation where I can Pareto, I mean, where, which is better on the Pareto front, but it is not EFX. So your fairness is kind of holding you back there. Where you're only reallocating. Yeah, when you're only reallocating within them, you can, I can show that, I mean, yeah, on the contrary, you can show that it is not Pareto optimal for additive valuations too. Okay, so additive valuation. So now I would like to introduce another notion of fairness, which is MMS, max min share. So, um, so when we talked about envy freeness, one good, I mean, any good to, I mean, given an allocation, if I ask an agent, have I been fair to him? To answer this question, he needs to look at the valuations of the other agents, right? But this is, uh, this is more of an individualistic notion of fairness. So every agent has kind of a, threshold, let's say, this threshold quantifying the bare minimum that he expects of the allocation that, I mean, I would define what this is in a minute, but just think of it as, I mean, this is the bare minimum he expects. And if I can find an allocation where every agent has at least his threshold, this is what is called the MMS threshold, then I'm fine. So here, for instance, the agent does not, I mean, here we don't need to look at every pairs of agents to see whether our fairness criterion is satisfied. It's more like an individualistic notion of fairness. And what is this bare minimum threshold that I'm talking about? So here I say that, okay, let's look at agent I, and I say that here are the set of goods. Know that there are n agents. Now you do the partition of the goods. But, make, uh, but know for a fact that you are going to get the worst bundle. Since you're having the liberty of the partition, you're going to get the worst bundle because Imagine that everybody has same valuations like you, but since you are doing the partition, I'm going to give you the last preference. Since everybody has the same valuation, they are going to take every, every, other, every other block which is more valuable, and you would be left with the block which is least valuable. So this is what I call the MMS threshold of an agent, the bare minimum that he expects, that you look over all the set of partitions, and what you want to maximize is the valuation for the, I mean, the smallest valuation for a bundle. So VI, I mean, this, this is actually... Yeah, there's the same subscript on the left and the right here over all the bundles. You look at the smallest bundle and you want to find a partition where you maximize this. So this is what is called the MMS threshold. Okay, what is capital N? The set of goods. And small n is the number of agents. So this, this is actually a function of the number of agents. It actually doesn't depend on the agents and their valuation functions, like I said. So this is a notion of fairness which just knows the number of agents and the number of goods. That's all that you need to know about... Um, to ask an agent whether it's being fair to him or not. Okay, so one observation is that for additive valuations, this can at most be VI of M over N, right? Be no. Yeah, this can be at most VI of M over N because, I mean, no matter which way you partition, the sum is actually the same. Because we're looking at additive valuations, this is very crucial. So this is kind of an upper bound on your MMS. I mean, just, just know this for, for a second. 
I mean, we would be using this immediately. So, okay, now I define this notion of fairness. It was defined in the same paper by Budish. And let's ask the same questions. Is it always possible to be fair, the notion being MMS? The answer is no. There is a very clever counterexample by Prokatsi and Wang. So I'm not going to discuss this counterexample, but henceforth people have looked at relaxations of MMS, basically approximate MMS. We're saying that asking for this much of a threshold may be too much. What if we ask for some alpha times MMS for any alpha between 0 and 1? So those are called approximate versions of MMS. There have been a lot of incremental work gradually improving this alpha. So I would just state the two state of the art. So in 2018, God Godsey and others gave a P task for finding a 3 over 4 approximate MMS allocation. This is a very, um, but this was the first paper to achieve this ratio, but this is very complicated. It's over 75 pages long. Uh, and um, quite recently, uh, Jugal and Sitara have given the same approximation factor, but it's a polynomial time algorithm, and it's, kind, and, and it's much simpler. But anyways, the message being that the current best approximation for MMS is actually 3 over 4. Now, why did I mention about MMS and all of these things? So let's look at our allocation. So if the size of the pool at the end of our algorithm is 0, then we have an EFX allocation. We have a complete allocation, which is EFX. Let's look at the other extreme. If you have n minus 1 goods, actually, then what can we say about the NV graph? We know that there are n sources in the NV graph, right? Because according to our update rule U3, as long as we have more number of goods than the number of sources in the NV graph, I can still make progress. So in that case, what does this NV graph look like? So you have n sources, and then there is this pool of unallocated goods, which also nobody envies. So look at any particular agent. He does not envy any of the remaining n bundles, none of the n minus 1 from the other agents, and not this extra bundle which has been unallocated. So I can say for a fact that whatever our algorithm promises here is at least vi of m over n plus 1, which is kind of very close, I mean, for large values of m to vi of m over n, which is an upper bound on the MMS. So in case, if you see, I mean, if you see that our algorithm has donated too many goods to charity, I mean, like n minus 1 goods, then you get very good approximation on MMS. I mean, if your n is sufficiently large, you beat the state of the art for additive valuations. And we can actually capture this. So what our allocation gives is 1 over 2 minus the size of the pool over n MMS. So if your p is 0, you have an EFX, but you still have a half approximation on MMS. And if the size of the pool is n minus 1, then you have almost EFX with charity, but you have, almost, uh, but you have 1 plus 1 over n plus 1 to the minus 1 MMS. Okay, so, so much about fairness. I, would, I won't be having much time, but let's see. So let's talk about efficient. So now, now the whole point being, I mean, we are talking about efficient fair allocations, right? So when do I want to call an allocation efficient? So efficiency is a kind of a measure of the total happiness that, I mean, maybe, I mean, the first glance it may look at the total happiness that the, um, that the allocation achieves. So one thing to look at may be a social welfare, that is these, some of these valuations, but come on, I mean, if there is one particular, so this is, this is definitely a no, because um, if there is one particular agent who says that he gets one million times happier than the others, no matter which good you give him, then an allocation which will optimize the social welfare will give everything to this particular agent. So this kind of doesn't go with the whole notion of fairness because it's not scale invariant. So maybe a thing to look at is social welfare but not at the cost of fairness. So if I can improve a particular person without decreasing the valuation of the others, maybe this can be a good measure of efficiency. So this is what we call Pareto optimality. So you say that an allocation X Pareto dominates an allocation Y if one agent is actually strictly better off in this allocation than he is in Y, and the other agents are at least the same. And an allocation is said to be Pareto optimal if it is not Pareto dominated by any other allocation. So in the sense that if I can strictly improve one of the agents without harming the others, and if your fairness is holding you back from doing this, then your fairness may not be an efficient fairness measure. It's, that's kind of uh, the gist of this. So how can we get something which is fair and efficient? 
So the right potential function to look at is not the sum of the utilities, rather the product of the utilities, which is also called the Nash social welfare. You look at the geometric mean of the valuations. Well, it's clear to see that anything that is Nash social wealth, I mean NSW optimal, is Pareto optimal too. Because if you can improve one of them strictly without decreasing the valuations of the others, you increase the product. And it is also gives you some sort of envy freeness guarantee because, well, I mean, it's a geometric mean, right? So if I can move the individual valuations kind of close to each other, then I improve the geometric mean. I mean, it's a very vague intuition, but kind of, I mean, what I would like to go with right now. So it was proved in, by Karyanis others that any allocation which maximizes this Nash social welfare is envy free up to one good, and it is Pareto optimal. So fairness and efficiency can be achieved if your fairness is EF1, for instance. In fact, Siddharth here actually has, has proved a paper with a stronger result that something which is even fractionally Pareto optimal. Oh, and the previous result, that it just said that anything that maximizes the product of utilities, this is definitely a hard problem. But in this paper, for instance, you know a pseudo polynomial time algorithm, which is actually, I think, weakly polynomial for rounded utilities, right? So uh, yeah, in this, uh, so he, he, this is an algorithmic proof, and here you guarantee EF1 plus fractionally Pareto optimal. I'm not defining what fractionally Pareto optimal is, but it is something which, which is strictly stronger than Pareto optimal. So as long as EF1 is cons uh, considered, you can achieve very good guarantees in terms of efficiency. What about EFX? So this is again an example in Tim's paper with Benjamin uh, that, well, EFX and Pareto optimality will not go hand in hand. So consider this simple example for two agents and three goods. So there is one particular good G2. So blue ed thick blue edges denote high utility. Light blue edges denote small, lesser utility. No edge denotes zero utility. So it's clear to see here that the only possible EFX allocation is to, keep, is to allocate this good as a singleton set. Uh, if, you allocate, uh, if, if you allocate anything more here, then it won't be EFX. For instance, if you give G1 or G3, then the other agent will envy G2. After, I mean, G2 would what, be, what would remain after removal, and G2 is the most expensive good. While a Pareto optimal allocation would actually give G1 and G2 and G3. I mean, G1 and G2 to one set and G3 to the other. It's, I mean, it's, it's uh, here, for instance, I'm assuming zero marginals. If you don't assume zero marginals, then you can kind of bypass this for two agents, but for three and higher, this, this will not hold. But anyways, what I'm trying, the message is that EFX with Pareto optimality is actually too much to ask for. So what could be an alternate measure of efficiency is people, because, well, I know that the Nash social welfare implies Pareto optimality. So why don't I look at the Nash welfare of an allocation? And I, I mean, if, I, if, I, if our allocation gives close enough optimal guarantees to the Nash social welfare, then also I can consider it to be optimal. And in this slide, there is this paper, quite recent paper by Karayanis. I don't have time, so I will not go through all the points here. So what this basically means is that there is a partial allocation, again, not a complete allocation, a partial EFX allocation, which gives a two approximation on Nash social welfare, only for additive valuations. So the hope is, can I get a complete EFX allocation with the same guarantee, where, well, I'm skipping certain slides, our algorithm will give a partial EFX with high Nash social welfare and with bounded charity, for instance. Like which, uh, where, where, where you have, because you just need to start cleverly at the beginning. So where you have less number of goods going to charity and nobody envies the pool. So yeah, so you have all these three guarantees, but still you don't have a complete EFX with high Nash social welfare. So that's why they actually conjectured this, that if you have a partial EFX allocation, then there exists a complete EFX allocation, which has the Nash social welfare at least as high as the partial one in their EC paper. The bad news is that this conjecture is false. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to talk about this, but I would take it on offline, but this is actually pretty interesting. This not only shows that there are efficiency barriers, but this also would imply some barriers to the current techniques of computing EFX allocations. So having said that, I would like to conclude with, say, maybe two open problems, which would be like, well, I mean, when you're looking at EFX, it's kind of, I mean, 
maybe Pareto optimality, like we said earlier, is difficult to achieve, but what about approximate EFX with Pareto optimality? We do not know the best alpha such that alpha EFX with Pareto optimality exists. While on the contrary, we know that for any approximate MMS, we can guarantee that with Pareto optimality. However, we, none of the approximations for MMS, the half, the two thirds, the three fourths, guarantee you Pareto optimality. So another thing is, can we, I mean, what is the best alpha such that we can compute an efficient alpha MMS allocation in polynomial time? And of course, the big open problem would be to get this EFX without this whole idea of unallocated goods. And also, like you saw, we can simultaneously get you good guarantees on MMS and with Nash Social Welfare. We also give simultaneous guarantees on GMMS, which I didn't discuss in the part of the talk, which is a notion which generalizes EFX and MMS. So the goal is, can we find an algorithm which can simultaneously achieve, I mean, several notions of fairness with good approximations at the same time, something which is, I mean, you may call universally fair. Yeah, that's all. Justin, and you sort of reminded me of the, the fact that uh, if, you, uh, if you treat the goods as divisible, then you can compute a CEI allocation where only an, at most n minus one goods are split because of the forest decomposition. But on, on, on one hand, that seems sort of close to this. Maybe you can take those n, at most n minus one goods that are split and do something with it. Uh, but on the other hand, it seems very far because uh, the, the CEI would, would split precisely the very high valued goods. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so have you thought about no. that connection? I have also an intuition which is kind of different than this for N agents. So my intuition is like, if you're in the case, I mean, this is very, very, very vague intuition, but still, that if you, have, if you have divisible goods, for instance, so what do you do? I mean, you take every good, you split it into N parts, and you give it to everyone, right? So here, as long as you have sufficiently valuable goods, if you have more than N sufficiently valuable goods, each of which there is one guy who uniquely champions, because this notion of this most envious agent in a way, then you can find a, like what can I say, a, a maximum weighted, ma I mean you can find a perfect matching in a way. So as long as you have larger than n goods, I mean this, this seems very natural to me that this n is a natural barrier. I mean anything that brings n minus 1 to n minus 2 may generalize, but I, I can't make a comment on that. But what you said of, I mean I haven't thought about it. <laughs>